Well, here we are, uh, our last in the series of face-to-face -face encounters in John's Gospel, our last heads up before the summer. Now, I hope you remember last week, uh, Beth showed us the extraordinary, beautiful restoration of Peter as Jesus extends that wonderful grace to him. And this week, you could say, is the restoration of the rest of the disciples. Uh, remember, when Jesus was arrested and Peter was, was busy denying Jesus three times over, the rest of them had scarpered. Uh, they were nowhere to be seen. And now we find them hiding in a locked room. Let's pick up the action uh, in John chapter 20, verse 19. We're just going to read those first four verses together. So John chapter 20, 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he'd said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. It's mad, isn't it? In the space of four verses, the disciples go from quivering wrecks to empowered missionaries. I mean, they don't seem to have believed Mary when she came back from the tomb uh, in verse 18. And so they're, they're locked in a room and they're terrified. Jesus' body is gone and they don't know what to do. So they're locked in a room. So Jesus comes to them. Somehow. I mean, did you notice that they're in a locked room and Jesus just appears? He, he just turns up. But that's not actually why we're here. Because just like with Peter, Jesus opens the conversation and he does so with amazing grace. That opening line, see his first words, peace be with you. I guess in, at one level he's showing them there is no hard feelings that they deserted him. But I think it goes more than that, it's deeper. He's forgiven them for abandoning him, yes, but he's forgiven them totally. See, peace be with you because my work on the cross is done. It is finished. Sin has been paid for. You are forgiven. Humanity is forgiven. No wonder he says, peace be with you. Now, I guess you'd be pretty shocked as well. And they don't seem to say anything. They're just stunned. I guess you would be, wouldn't you? I mean, your, your friend, you've been with him for three years and you've just seen him crucified on a hilltop in front of all those people. And out of nowhere, he's just a, appeared in the room. And you can always hear the jaws dropping and hitting the floor. <clears throat> and that moment's pause as they take it all in. I mean, Jesus picks up on their shock, doesn't he? And, and so he shows them his hands and his side. Hey guys, it's me. The hands where the nails went in. The side where the soldier's spear skewered him. There is no doubting. This is the risen Lord Jesus. And they are overjoyed. And rightly so. And just like with Peter, Jesus gives them a new purpose as well. Verse 21. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me. I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So he's given them a new purpose. He's given them a new authority. Just like with Peter, they are forgiven, reinstated, restored. But there's one disciple missing from that first meeting. Thomas. Now you probably know about Thomas. Uh, he's become pretty famous as Doubting Thomas. In fact, he's, he's kind of the first century equivalent of a, a meme. But let's check out what happens with him. Verse 24 to 29. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And through, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Unless I see the nail marks, unless I put my finger into the wounds, unless I put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. It's pretty gruesome words from Thomas, isn't it? But I mean, I wouldn't fancy sticking my finger into an open wound. But Thomas is so stubborn that this isn't true, that he's willing to bet he'll never have to do that. And it is a weak before Jesus shows up again. A week. Can you imagine the chat that went on? I don't think the disciples would have dropped it all week. Would do you? Thomas, come on. We all saw him. We all believe. Jesus is risen. No. I'm not believing it. Not unless I put my hand into his wounds. It's just not true. It's not possible. Thomas, please, believe this. We all saw him. No. Not believing it. It's not possible. Thomas, please, come on. It's real. He's alive. No, I'm not going to. Peace be with you. Jesus is back in almost a carbon copy of uh, the face-to-face -face meeting the week before. And this time he goes straight to Thomas. Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. How would you respond? How would you respond in that moment? After a, a life of teaching with God-given authority, incredible signs and miracles, and then seeing Jesus crucified on top of a hilltop. And now he's, he's here, walking around, speaking, walking through walls, scars and all, living and breathing. How would you respond? Because Thomas responds. And there's no denying it, is there? Thomas responds big time. He responds in the, the only way he can. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. See, Thomas, Thomas responds in worship. He is face to face with the risen Jesus. Uh, more than that, he's, he's face to face with the truth, with the resurrection and the life with the Lord himself. Uh, 
Now, we've seen a lot of stories uh, this term of people coming face to face with Jesus, a lot of encounters with him. And if you remember right back at the start, the, the promise, the certain hope was that one day we will see Jesus face to face. And that is true. One day we will. But in the meantime, it, it can be hard, can't it? Hard to believe. Just like Thomas, we struggle when we don't see Jesus face to face. But did you spot Jesus' words of comfort to Thomas? Uh, verse 29, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me. One day we'll see, but for now we can't. But we are blessed if we do believe. In fact, so true are those words that John decides to follow them up with words of his own. An author's note, if you like. Jesus says, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. And John follows by saying, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. purpose of the entire book of the gospel that we will believe that Jesus is the Messiah the promised one the son of God and that by believing we may have life in his name Amen